Welcome to IEP Radio, a show dedicated to the education of all things indoor environmental quality related. And now here's your host, Michael Schrantz. Welcome to IEP Radio. This is episode 32. I'm very excited to have the opportunity to speak once again with Dr. Richie Shoemaker. On this interview, we're going to be talking about a health-based explanation of ERMI or Environmental Relative Moldiness Index, Hurts Me Too, and even things beyond that. This is a special interview that follows up after the previous interview I did with John Banta, who's a certified industrial hygienist on the environmental applications of ERMI and Hurts Me. And after receiving a lot of positive feedback, we wanted to reach out to Dr. Shoemaker and see if we could maybe talk to him a little bit about kind of where the ERMI came from into his practice, the Shoemaker protocol that he developed, the Hurts Me Too that he created, and some of the newer tests that have come out um, from his research. Um, you can find a ton of information about Dr. Shoemaker online, just a couple quick tidbits. Uh, he did graduate from Duke Medical School in 1977. He has over 45 published papers, written 14 books, and currently runs a family practice. Uh, some of you listening might know him through the website survivingmold.com. He is truly a pioneer in our industry. Uh, he is a, a stickler for the data. He's an incredible, brilliant mind. I'm sure you'll enjoy this incredibly rich interview with Dr. Shoemaker. Welcome back to the show, Dr. Shoemaker. Thank you so very much. It's great to see you, especially with this scruffy little, little mustache and beard that you've got now. <laughs> uh, you know, since you've been on, it's been a minute. Episode three, you were on IEP radio and I had that little baby face going on. I got too many people saying I look too young for my age. So I thought I'd trick them a little bit. I even added a little bit of gray hair uh, in there for everybody. So um, I really appreciate you taking the time to meet with me to set the stage for everybody listening. Um, we just got done recording uh, episode 30. Episode 30 was with myself and John Banta, a CIH in the field where we really dove into uh, the topics of um, PCR, QPCR, MSQPCR, and other terms that you may, may be more familiar with, ERMIs, HERTSMEs, and how we all want to use that in the field, how forensic it can be. And we also dive into some of the issues brought up uh, involved with like letters that came out from the EPA suggesting that it should be only used for research purposes. I'm referring to, of course, the ERMI sampling. So John and I do a great job. But one of the things that we weren't able really to dive into as much as I wanted to naturally was kind of the health or clinical perspective of it all. And so what better way to kind of dive into that when we think about ERMIs, we think about HERTSMEs, and we think about of all the doctors, all the practitioners out there who are using ERMI, what better way to bring in Dr. Shoemaker to kind of give us his perspective. Now, we're not just going to be talking about ERMIs today. We're going to be talking about actinos, endotoxins, and we might bring in a few other nuggets of information. But I wanted to start with some basics just as a quick recap. Uh, you guys can learn more information about what we're going to talk about here shortly by visiting episode three. But what I want to start off to is why we're here in the first place. We're doing testing in the field and the environment because we think there's an exposure. And Dr. Shoemaker, for you, there's a story of how it all got started in this little town, and it wasn't necessarily a moldy building that got it started. What I'd like to do, since you did such a wonderful job in episode three, covering that story and giving us the much richer history of it all, is to let's just help clear the air on some recent things I've seen. For example, the term CIRS, chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Where did that come from? Who, who coined the term? Uh, can you give us any information here? In uh, 2010, uh, Scott McMahon and uh, Laura, Laura Mark were responsible for writing the Policyholders of America paper. Uh, Sharon, uh, of course, is is one of the heroines of the early days of the, of the mold movement. So we need to mention her name as well. Yeah. But SIRS comes from 2010. Before then, it had been chronic inflammatory, it had been uh, 
biotoxin illnesses, hypo, a variety of, of, of names. In, in, in litigation, the lawyers always say, well, what is it? Well, what's the name you're going to call this? <laughs> 2010, and it, it landed. And uh, that's that's where we are. So, Richie, I, I don't want to put you on the spot at all. Um, I just, I hear different doctors saying to their patients that they have CIRS. And for the longest time, I always thought that was something that you coined. You gave credit to other individuals, and I recognize that. But I always kind of associated it with the work that you were doing, uh, the Shoemaker Protocol, which we can mention briefly here in a little bit. But I, I guess the confusion is, is when I think about CIRS, I think about a patient who's following your protocol, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, your 12-step protocol. And yet I know other clinicians that have diagnosed their patients by using that term, but they're doing different sorts of testing to diagnose them, like mycotoxin urine analysis or other sorts of testing. So I just wanted to clear the air, or at least get your opinion. Can CIRS, is that a term that can be used holistically, even if the treatment method is different? Or if you say I have CIRS, does that, so is that supposed to mean that it's being treated following your protocol? Help me get through the weeds here. Well, the term SIRS is a specific term with a specific case definition. And if individual does not meet potential for exposure, symptoms the same or similar to those seen in water damage building patients published, similar or the same as labs that have been published, um, and then response to treatment, they don't have all of those. They're not a SIRS case. The case definition needs to be met. And if someone neglects to do the testing, then they can't call it SIRS. They can say, in my experience, this is the same as SIRS. Well, I think that what we, with our diagnosis, we should be prepared to defend that diagnosis in court. And if you have uh, sleezed a little bit on, on one of the tests and didn't do uh, ACTH and cortisol because you didn't think it was necessary, that's your right as a physician. I can't quibble with, with physicians being independent practitioners. But if you can call it SIRS, which has been published internationally and peer-reviewed and reproduced countless numbers of times, it better be SIRS. And then when I get patients call me for help on, on the phone, they say, well, I've got SIRS. Okay, well, what's your MMP9? Well, I didn't have it. Uh, what's, what's your C4A? Well, I didn't have it. And what's your anticlyadin antibodies? Well, I didn't have it. Well, the doctor may have convinced himself that he had SIRS, but it's not technically SIRS. Okay. And that, 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 gets, that gets into some confusing different issues, right? To whatever consequences maybe not always yet known. If somebody listening right now wanted to learn more about that diagnostic criteria and they're, they're, not a, they're, they're a patient, they're wanting to learn more, they're hearing you, what would be the quickest way to find that? Does Surviving Mold have any options? Sure. The Surviving Mold Certified Physician section is found under Find a Doctor. And everybody that's certified has got to write an essay saying, what is the Shoemaker Protocol? And have it right. And make sure that um, they're using King's English and all that so that we can read it and, and, and publish cycles. Let's see. So like I'm on your page right now. Am I close? Yeah. And under each doctor, you will find an essay, what is the Shoemaker Protocol? Oh, wow. Wonderful. For the sake of time, uh, uh, I will type SA2, SA1, yeah. SA2. Right, exactly. I won't, I won't take more of your time, but the audience can just know if you want to learn more about that specific diagnostic criteria to learn more about what CIRS is by the, the definitions, go to uh, survivingmold.com go to the find a physician list of certified practitioners and go from there, read the essays. You can learn more there. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you for that. The, um, essays, the essays are all right. Right. Okay. Okay. So we know that there's a 12 step protocol. We're not, in, we're not here today to talk about all of the steps, but I would like to talk about step one. It seems like if there ever was consensus in the industry, there's all these camps of this doctor likes this, but doesn't like that. There's a lot of polarization, more than I'd care to admit, but we both know the reality. 
it seems like there's a lot of consensus with removing yourself from exposure. I've yet to find a doctor that says, if you have a moldy basement, no problem, keep sleeping in it. So exposure's a, a big thing and getting out of exposure, other than maybe the obvious part of not being exposed anymore is critical to recovery, or perhaps you might say the speed of recovery. That invites another, and, and you correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, that invites this idea of, well, how do we sample the environment? How do we look at the environment? In 2006, ERMI was commercialized, Environmental Relative Moldiness Index, the dust sample that we talk a lot about in episode 30. Before that, there was an ERMI. Richie, were you thinking about mold prior to ERMIs? If you were, and about exposure, how were you sampling the environment before Ermes came out? The first patient that I treated for an exposure to water damaged building was in 1998. And I documented before and after of the labs we had back then, which would primarily was, was a VCS. We had very little back in 1998. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, biotoxin illness patients as, as kind of a rubric name got started in 1997. So it was just a year, a year afterwards. And back then, uh, we would do tape lift samples, but all, all, all we had. And there's nothing wrong with tape lifts. Uh, I think the, the tape lifts don't show all we need to know, but that's to answer your question. That's, that's what I used. I almost felt for a second like you were uh, not giving VCS testing as much credit as, it, as, it, as I feel it deserves. I mean, VCS can be a great tool it still is a great tool. Would you agree for if some real-time? If you're landing on the moon and you're worried about having, whether you've got SIRS or not, first tool that you bring out of the spacecraft is VCS. And you <laughs> okay. keep it with you at all times. Right. Fair enough. Okay. All right. We're on the same page. All right. So then moving forward, what got your interest with ERMI? I mean, you're doing tape lift samples back in the late 90s. You got to start somewhere. You're getting some good information. What turned you on to ERMI? Why, how did it get Dr. Shoemaker's attention? In 2003, I gave a talk with Steve Vesper in San Diego. It was uh, October 4th, I think, because we landed in the middle of a brush fire in San Diego. And it was rather dramatic. But oh. um, Steve is a brilliant man, and I say that to anybody who asks me. Uh, and he was leading the way uh, with diagnosis of building problems the way some other people said I was leading the way in treatment. Because back then, we, we didn't have any, any unified uh, treatment. The, the protocol came out in 2002. So he turns you on to this ERM, this ERMI sampling. But I mean, that was back in 2003, or there's about some initial research perhaps that was going on because it wasn't commercialized until 06. So you had the opportunity to kind of get behind some of the research, learn about this new type of test that's going to eventually in 06 be commercialized where it's DNA based. It's looking at uh, 36 target organisms, or in this case, mold species, uh, and is able to detect the DNA, which uh, opened up a whole other level of resolution. Now we're able to detect fragments that were previously flat out missed with microscopy looking under a microscope. Um, and, and you started noticing a pattern um, you're going to help correct me if I'm wrong on this, but before the Hurts Me Too came out, I don't want to get ahead of myself, you were starting to look at people's homes using the ERMI, and you did find some value in that, right? Absolutely. There's been a lot of argument and a lot of hot air about ERMI um, as time has, has gone by. Uh, what Steve did was brilliant for fungi. Uh, it's, but unfortunately, it was like looking at an apartment building with 20 floors and counting the number of people who live in it on the first two floors has represented the whole building. Hmm. Missed actinos and missed endos, missed VOCs. But that was not, they were not supposed to be looking at things that they wasn't, wasn't programmed to do. Uh, it was a huge study across the country, uh, sampling homes that were water damaged versus sampling not. Uh, and, and then how do you define a water damaged building if you don't have a measure of exposure? So it was a little arbitrary along that way. But the real issue is that for all the, all the uh, brouhaha we had about ERMI, 
uh, it was leading the way to five years later where we saw which organisms in the type one organisms for, for ERMI really were statistically showing up more likely by a factor of 10 to one uh, stratified by the AW or activity of water these organisms grew in. Right. And we found five, five. Right. We didn't include the type two organisms. So they were benign primarily. But the type one organisms, there's a lot of there, a lot of ones there that don't belong there. But statistically, they're not showing up as human health factors that we can correct. And I say that because uh, if someone has a hypersensitivity to pneumonia, that's not SIRS, but you can get that from some of the fungi in type one that's not represented on hurts me too. But hurts me too is only looking at fungi. I made the same mistake that Steve made of not including what else was there. Well, you, you're giving. Like you're we, not, didn't, you're, we, didn't, we didn't have next generation sequencing. I was going to say. I think you're being a little bit hard on yourself. I mean, I guess 2020 hindsight's uh, coming into play here. But when you came out with the paper that looked at hurts me too um, health effects roster of types uh, type specific formers of mycotoxins and inflammatins inflammagens, the second version. Well, that's a mouthful. But when you came out with that, it's because you were you were evolving, you were pioneering the work. You know, now we have a now we have something that the EPA, Dr. Vesper gets a ton of credit for this. I know there were many others that were helping, um, creates this new form of testing to identify things that were previously unable to be practically identified in the field. And what you started noticing was that, you know, are there, there like any evolution of data, you took the ERMI, which is a measure of the building's health, and said, I'm going to evolve it and make it a little bit more specific for human health. Exactly. And created the Hurts Me Too, which right. which I agree from a non-clinical environmental collecting thousands of these samples myself, agree that when you typically have an elevated uh, Hurts Me score, it typically correlated with a higher incidence of a problem going on in the home, a source. Um, and and don't forget, it's the warning about re-exposure to a home with an elevator or a building with an elevated hurts me too. If you've had SIRS before and you were treated, you go back into a high hurts me building or an army missed a third of these folks, but it hurts me too missed five percent. Right. People who are at risk for re-exposure and relapse. Right. And so, and just to clarify again, to hit that point again. The ERMI wasn't a health-based index. We, right. you, you were working to create something that was tailored a little bit more uh, by the numbers uh, for the health, and that's why we have that missing only five percent versus thirty percent with the hurts me. So it's all this positive evolution of of MSQPCR analysis helping allow us to do these sorts of scoring systems, these interpretations of the data now. Obviously, we both probably strongly feel, I know you wrote a paper, we don't have to get all into it, but just to say that it's a shame that ERMI and, and, and MSQPCR, kind of like the baby getting thrown out with the bathwater, was brought up the way that it was. And John and I talk a lot about that in episode 30 of it's kind of like, you can have an opinion about ERMI, you can, you can have an opinion about its validity, what it's intended to be used for. Can the public abuse it any different than they can abuse any other sort of test? I think the answer is yes. But to throw out MSQPCR, or at least not make it clear that we have a wonderful new type of analysis method for mold, I feel like the paper, I feel like the posturing really did a disservice uh, to our industry. Let me ask you this question, Dr. Shoemaker. To Even to date, I know we're going to dip into actinos and, and endotoxins, so we'll get there. But from the standpoint of mold, do you still see the value? Do you still see the outcomes of patient recovery when we're seeing passing hurts me scores, when we're seeing acceptable ERMIs, that sort of thing? Well, re remember, uh, hurts me too is, is an offspring of ERMI. So as opposed to discussing, do we have benefit from ERMI? Yes, we do. And even better, the, the newer, faster model with, with more horsepower is hurts me too, which has even more value. But I cannot imagine trying to assess 
fungal contamination without considering ERMI or hurts me too. They are specific for fungal problems, not for the other ones, of course. Uh, but you know, to find and in this this paper, as it's an essay in our session called "As I See It" uh, from 2014, I, I do think it's worthwhile for, especially the the CIH guys or the IEPs, to know what the logical fallacies of the uh, Arthur Elkins' opinion is. Um, he was the inspector general back then. He, he's he's not qualified to talk about buildings. All right. Right. And you, I read this paper again last night and I was reminded of your points. I mean, even just technicalities like validation. Well, what is the criteria for validation? Wait, I thought EPA doesn't validate things. There's so many great points that you brought up that I think the public, including myself, just didn't think, thought about. I guess it's that whole idea of you, you see something, you assume it's true, it's official because it's got a nice letterhead and it's got the EPA stamp or something on it that is supporting basically to use it for research purposes and then it's the then it's the irony of well isn't that what we're doing i joked not so much but with john about wasn't well, that what we do as assessors when we go into buildings as professionals aren't we researching it uh, right. uh, uh it's it's just it's a shame but fortunately they didn't mandate it can't be used they offered an opinion and i got to tell you many clinicians i work with many practitioners I work with, colleagues, that sort of thing that are using these ERMIs in the right hands, the right application with, with a great level of responsibility that you would have anyways, like, why are we doing this? What's the value? What questions are it's answering? Do we need to do something else first? Is still the greatest tool, I think, by itself. Now, once we get to that point in the conversation, we realize, well, yeah, but we, evolution doesn't just stop there. In the more recent years, you've talked about actinos and endotoxins and other things for a very long time. But in the last couple of few years, actinos and endotoxins have really been surfacing conversations, topics, now testing offered through uh, one of the laboratories right now in virobiomics uh, for this type of testing. And a big part of that came about in response to the continued research that you've done. It's not just about mold. Can we talk to people and tell me if I got the right paper up? Can we talk to the folks that are listening about why did you start looking at actinos and or endotoxins more critically? The reason this paper on metabolism is so important is that we had focused on inflammation. In fact, put that in the name, SIRS, chronic inflammatory response syndrome. But it should be chronic inflammatory and metabolic response syndrome. Because the metabolism abnormalities are the areas where this takes SIRS and expands it to chronic renal failure, chronic heart failure, TH17, Treg imbalance. You're gonna find that, that this is now in the general workplace as opposed to just water damaged buildings when you put the metabolic abnormalities together. As we now know, the basic prom premise of the met metabolic abnormalities comes from molecular hypometabolism. That's a long way to say the RNA that the body pr produces is not letting proteins be made normally. And in the RNA is blocking uptake of pyruvate, one of the glucose metabolites into, met into mitochondria, so that if you can't get pyruvate into mitochondria, you're not gonna have energy made by mitochondria. So this lack of energy, this fatigue, and then together with the, the more fatigue and protein abnormalities really is, is now superseding our understanding of SIRS by putting it together and make it SIRS and, and metabolism. As a subset, and this was just 112 patients, it was done in, in hurriedly, but specifically there were physiologic abnormalities we saw in 80% of the, all those people. Uh, Metabolic acidosis is the easiest and cheapest way uh, to, uh, for a physician or a healthcare provider of any kind to get an idea of, is there a problem? And inflammation will cause a widened anion gap. And if you find metabolic acidosis, that goes, takes us back to Warburg with his ideas about how sugar is metabolized. And if there are problems with sugar metabolism, as Warburg told us in 1925 and 1928, he died in 1952, I think. But he had 
you know, 25 years of preaching to the choir about Warburg physiology. It begins with conversion of pyruvate into lactic acid. That's the acid that gets excreted outside of a cell against the gradient that's not being used normally to produce glucose. So to, or to get energy from glucose, excuse me. So all of this is now tied to uh, more problems of, of physiology. Pulmonary hypertension is incredibly common uh, in SERS patients. And we can use one of the tests that's new called Genie. It's, it's a it's transcriptomic test. See, Debbie, thank you. And basically what we, we do with pulmonary hypertension is to measure the tricuspid regurgitation velocity. It's a, one of the valves and blood's going back the wrong way. And we can use a nomogram or an algorithm to then calculate pulmonary artery pressure. So when you see someone with SIRS and they say, I'm tired, I get short of breath, don't be thinking cardiac disease first and foremost. You, of course, will improve that, include that in the differential diagnosis, but be thinking pulmonary hypertension. Uh, that ended some of my career in 2012. I, and my, my cardiologist told me, well, put your things together because uh, you don't have much time left. The so the rest here. so we, know, we know things, we have a better picture of what's going on underneath the skin. Let me ask the dumb question. Where does actino, what does actinos have anything to do with that? Actinos are the leading cause of production of metabolic abnormalities. There it is. It'll, it'll fix mitochondria. It'll fix the uh, uh, structure one and structure three in the electron transport chain. And there are specific compounds made by actinos, valinomycin for one, that will knock out voltage dependent anion channels, which is required to get pyruvate across the matter of mitochondrial membrane uh, into the mitochondria. You don't get pyruvate, the necessary metab metabolite, without having VDAC working, and actinos knock it out. Oh, wow. So, so the combination of putting together where did the metabolism abnormalities come from, we also find endotoxins doing things. We find extending the, the, the pattern. All we knew before for as far as abnormalities in the brain is that 95% of people had cognitive abnormalities. Uh, that's that's pretty pretty standard to what people have improved. But where did we see <clears throat> gray matter nuclear atrophy? And I don't think you have that paper on, on today's talk. No. 2017, we were able to show with VIP we could correct gray matter nuclear atrophy. Now, people around the world might fix one nucleus or another nucleus, but to fix five at a time, that was a first and still is. But specifically, we've also found cortical gray atrophy and superior lateral ventricle enlargement they're responsible from uh, actinos and, and endos, respectively. If you see four nuclear atrophy out of six and cortical gray atrophy, you've got an endotoxin energy injury. I mean, Neuroquan will show you that. And when someone says, I can't afford the $89 to get a Neuroquan, I said, well, go beg or borrow it, steal it somewhere. Here, here's a check. You just, you just go get it. Because your problem with your brain is in your brain. It's inflammatory and metabolic in the brain. The problem is that when you don't deliver energy properly, I've heard a lot of people say brain on fire. Hell no, this is brain in the ice cube. This is brain <laughs> on ice. Right. If you don't have the energy to use the sodium potassium pump the way we want to, those neurons won't work right. And the neurons will die over time. And that's where VIP comes in because it will restore the energy production in cells inside the brain. Wow. So, okay. So how did it, was it the genie research? Can we talk a little bit about that? I have other questions about actinos, but what was it that, how were you able to see that relationship that, that you're exposed to actinos and this is what's happening inside of you? Is that, talk to us about genie, talk to us about how you saw this research showing actinos being an issue. Without next generation sequencing, there was no knowledge of actinos, no knowledge of endos. There was no available test available. About 2018, I think Dr. David Lark uh, was responsible for bringing next generation sequencing. There's David Lark. Uh, that's the last paper. That's 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 yeah. the brilliant one. That's David's brilliance. Okay, so what about this one? 
this is, uh, that should be in a volume three. Uh, the, yeah, this, this one was the first one to come out. Okay, okay, okay. Well, there's your next gen sequencing. By having next gen sequencing available on a commercial basis, an affordable commercial basis, we can now see whether actinos were involved. We have some markers, some molecular markers that have just accumulated over time. We, Jimmy Ryan invented uh, Genie, and I had something to do with it. We both have our patent holders. But specifically, this is a test that will tell us of the physiology and give us specific causation, something we've longed for, wanted for, and now we have specific causation using gening for actinos and for endos. We don't have to argue with the uh, IEPs anymore. <laughs> well, if you had a sewage loss, it's not a hard argument for gram-negative bacteria. I can go with that. That's, that's uh, right. That's right. Um, okay, so then let's see if I can stitch this together for those of us that don't have Dr. Shoemaker's IQ. Um, we started with mold. Mold's a great surrogate um, for a lot of things, water damage, building related. Um, it, we've had some fantastic, we still have fantastic uh, analysis methods for that, MSQ-PCR. We know that Dr. Shoemaker helped create the Hurts Me Too, this, ver this roster at looking at specific mold species that really just didn't seem to fit in that well with a home that hadn't been water damaged. Um, it turns out to be that that thing correlates pretty well too, even in my own environmental experience, usually a high hurts me score means there's typically a problem. We usually find one, but as we continue the journey, we realize that there's new technologies coming about next generation sequencing has been around, um, from a clinical perspective, clinicians having access to it, gram positive bacteria, actinos come about. And now we're looking at that because through your research, through the genie and now um, uh, studies of showing gene expression and how our bodies are responding, how our cells are responding. I believe that's transcriptomics. If I don't butcher that completely, um, we're realizing that, Hey, we need to pay more attention at actinos. And that leads me to, I'll still get to endotoxins, but then that leads us to another big hot topic right now going on. And I only deal with this about twice a day, Richie. So yeah. I would say it's rough. human habitat versus soil habitat. Okay. When I hear that, I think you got actinos that thrive, they're commensal on your skin or otherwise on your body. And then when I think soil habitat, I think that of an actino that's originating from the soil. Tell me I'm wrong or correct me. No, you're, you're, you're right. It was a matter of sorting out the different species of uh, actinobacteria, uh, which is what you mean when you say actinos, but specifically, by sorting out what was responsible for, for sick people or not, paralleling what we did with Hurts Me Too, it led us to you know, a, lot of, a lot of information we didn't otherwise have. We could start developing indices and look to see what percentage of, of uh, that was the one in, in October of 2011. Mm. Yes. I, I think this is the indices paper. Yeah, so... So you, you no, that's, make, that's 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 the, that's the one from November 2020. So which one are we looking for again? There I have this is not this the one it's not this one. Volume nine number issue eleven. Volume nine issue. Oh, this one the one we were on. How about that one? Got it. So like the hurts me to research you did, you were looking for specific species you were trying to narrow down how did that study look like how did you put that together how, how did you take an ngs report showing hundreds of available actino bacteria and narrow it down to focus on a subset and then maybe tell us up talk to us about the shoemaker indices while you're at it well you and larry schwartz were the first two that i know of who are doing uh, next generation sequencing um, as a routine thing, and, and we had discussions about pathogenic versus non-pathogenic actinos. Right. And the pathogenics, I, I had copies of reports that you had sent in, and Larry had sent in, and I had sent in, and others had sent in. And I started saying, okay, we've got 65 species listed, and we're going to knock out 10% 
that are they're showing up rarely. So that took us down to 90%, down to about 40 species. Um, so most of the, of the organisms that are called pathogenic were not showing up in, in, in sick people. So why would, why would we say they're pathogenic if we can't show the illness? But by looking at organisms that were present in people with an illness, we could then see where are, where are they coming from? And that's where the indices showed that soil uh, organisms are, they make smells, sure, um, and then they're not good for wood, not good for basements, you don't want that, but they're not responsible for the metabolic abnormalities, information that you had no way of getting because you didn't have Genie. So <laughs> that, was, that was what I was working on. It's, it's, it's 288 genes over 60 species uh, summarized and broken down into who's sick, who's sick and who's not. So that was the, that was the nature of the beast. It was a lot of work. Yeah, and it seems like unless there's been updated research that, and this may be to your point you just made, that most of it appears to be human um, human habitat related. That seems to be the focus of concern and an imbalance, some sort of dysregulation or something where either, maybe it's a combination, Richie, you can help clarify. So if someone is showing gene expression, exposure and issue from it to um, actinobacteria, it seems like a lot of times on their samples, the, the, the indices would suggest human habitat. The question that follows that would be, are they, is it that they're producing excess amounts of human habitat type actinos? And, or is it more, no, they may not necessarily be regu uh, producing more of it, but they certainly are responding to whatever exposure they are in. The dose response relationship is a hard one to, to, to figure out because it's more of a genetic susceptibility of the individual to the organism for which mm -hmm. there's not a dose response relationship. Because you can see, you know, uh, P. acne is a human pathogen and, and present in, in, in 1.6 million uh, organisms. We saw that uh, from Karen Johnson yesterday, 1.6 million on, on the skin. But right. Then, but then on, on my scan, there's 8,000 and I'm not sick anymore. So where is where is the cutoff? Well, 10,000 is the cutoff. So you're going to say if there's a difference between 10,000 and 12,000, that's very not not much very not very much of a qualitative difference or quantitative difference. But it is saying you draw a line statistically and the lines in the sand and it might be the wrong side of the wave. But that's that's where it is. Right. And just like, you know, if you need four of 10 items for a diagnosis of SIRS, that's not three. That's not two. It's four. And looking at all 10, that's not looking at eight. It's not looking at six. It's looking at 10. Right. And you unfortunately have got to repeat the work done of people who, who led the way uh, in order to validate your work against what the accepted published standard is. Yeah. So actinos work. Right. Actinos are huge. We know that. Does that mean that it's kind of a trick question, but does that mean that as an environmental professional in the field, should we stop focusing on doing actino sampling from like more of your water damage buildings? Or is there still value to look at the human habitat? Because we're we're not qualified as IEPs to tell you what's how to bathe your your body or what you know what sort of topical cream to use if that sort of thing exists how should an iep look at actinos in the field the curveball that you, that you haven't mentioned yet and I, and I know you will in just a minute is that actinos respond to pheromones so that an actino sitting in in part of the uh, bedroom or bathroom or a closet you know, the inner sanctum can send out trimethylamine uh, into the air, and it will attract other actinos to come from the living room into the bedroom. So if you sample the living room and find something and find and then sample the bedroom and don't find something, well, come back next week, come back next month, because it'll be moved in. This questing of actinos in response to um, this alkalizing agent also has a role because the alkalizing agent will inhibit growth of fungi. So actinos are gathering together in great conventions 
to kick out the fungi so they can grow uninhibited and have all the cellulose they want to eat. <laughs> wow. So. Oh, wait, there's more. There's there's more. Oh, my goodness. I don't know if we have enough time today, but there is a heck of a lot more. If you think the human habitat, if you look at it at the human skin, about a square meter. But if you look at the skin below the surface of the skin, that's 25 square meters of sebaceous glands and oil glands. At the base of those is where you find the residence, the, the, the nighttime sleeping quarters of actinos. They'll squeeze out and come out of the skin every once in a while. But it says that our, what are measures of human habitat on the top of the skin does not equal what's below the skin. And our skin biopsy now is we, we basically use isopropyl alcohol behind the ear to squeeze the oil gland, to squeeze the sweat gland, to get us an idea of what's, what's going on with actinos. And with actinos, things get worse before they get better. Well, maybe Karen Johnson's patient did a sample at midnight and you sampled your ear at 12 p.m. Could that have made a difference? Uh, we haven't pr proven that one way or another, but it's okay. a great question. You know, how, how much flux is there? Right. What I'm focusing on is that actinos in human habitat coming from the bedroom or they were before they'd been in the living room, not mm -hmm. on your shoes, not, not soil habitat, human habitat, these guys make little tiny blebs, little, little spaceships or space shuttles from the Star Trek days. You're not old enough to remember that, but I am. I've seen reruns. Yeah, okay, there you go. Uh -huh. <laughs> old <laughs> reruns, okay, let's rub it in. <laughs> anyway, those spaceships leave the sebaceous gland, the oil glands, and penetrate this layer of skin just below that, Oh, the RET ridge, R-E-T-E ridge. That's where the blood vessels are. So these space shuttles will get in a bloodstream and it'll be shunted throughout the body. And these make extracellular products of toxins, DNA, RNA, all these inflammatory generators. They turn on TOL2, if not TOL4 receptors. They do all these kinds of things. And they're doing it because somebody gave them a home for the night at the bottom of the sweat gland. And if he sits there long enough, you will have actino byproducts in, 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 in human beings. Now, Larry asked a good question. Well, how come actinos do that, but endos don't? Well, actinos have a cell membrane fragment called mycolic acid that gram-negative rods don't really have much at all. And there's a fountain, Staph aureus has it, a few gram-positives, verculosis and, 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 and um, uh, leprosy all have these, these these mycolic acids, the pathogen generators are these fragments of membranes of actinos. Now, how about that for some science nobody's heard of? Oh, sure. And and so what, is, what happens then, Richie, if let's just say that we know that someone tests their home for mold and it comes back good. It reflects normal fungal ecology. Nothing seems to be out of balance. Nothing seems to be pulling any red flags. It hurts me score. It looks great. If they're dealing with actinos, we're not necessarily gutting down walls. I mean, you got to understand most of the IAPs that are listening right now, we're so kind of tooled to that idea of like find the source, set up a containment, remediate it, clean the surfaces, the whole bit. But we're 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 skipping on the surface of saying that this might be a different sort of exposure that obviously is going to require a little bit type of attention. You're right. It's it's a uh... It's, it's a game changer. Yeah. Because the things that, that you have shown so successfully in the past with fungi don't apply to endos, don't apply to actinos. And, and, and it turns out multiple different times we've counted up uh, causation of illnesses uh, in, in sick people using Genie. 42% of patients uh, on average are sickened by actinos. 28% are sickened by endotoxins and 7% are sickened by fungi. So the, the value of Hurts Me Too, I thought it was great in 2011 when I presented it at Eckhart Drew Hanning's uh, conference, but it's, it's now kind of, kind of going by the wayside. There okay, so I'm hearing, I mean, I'm hearing an audience member in the back and here's what he's yelling right now, Richie. I wanna hear your response to this. Here's what the person said. They said, I just heard what you said, Dr. Shoemaker, about the 7% with mold and the higher percentages with actinos and endotoxins. Are you telling me that if I have a person with a moldy basement, don't worry about it? No, I'm not saying that at all. 
uh, of, the, of the people who are sick and fungi certainly uh, have historically been, been the, the worst ones. We're finding out there's competition from that. We have to expand our approach to a water damaged building to, to get rid of the fungi. Oh yes, indeed, get rid of the fungi. But you also got to get rid of these other guys or else you're going to have a relapse and you'll blame it on when he went downtown to have a restaurant serve meal and he'd not been there before. Well you're said. blaming it on, on, on an exposure, not recognizing that actinos have got a way to move to change the exposure week to week and month to month. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a new paradigm, literally another tool in the IEP's toolbox to consider out in the field. Um, certainly a little bit more complicated than the, the scope of our conversation today, but it really involves good communication between the client or patient, the practitioner, and the IEP to make sure we're doing the right sort of an assessment. Certainly, we're looking for the water damage. Certainly, we're doing the visual inspection. We're getting down the history. We're sampling to answer specific questions. But Actinos is a whole other ball game. And as the research coming out of your end and others is suggesting that there's a lot more to Actinos than we realize. Uh, it, 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 it helps justify another episode where we dive in deeper. Let's talk about endotoxins a little bit. So gram negative bacteria. When I went to training uh, to get my certifications and it wasn't during the old rerun periods, it wasn't that long ago. Um, I remember my teacher said, if you have um, a sewage loss, that would, you'd be wanting to look for gram negative bacteria, maybe do like a coli alert test where you send it off to mycometrics and you sample for E. coli and total coliforms. Um, your research is certainly complementary in some regards to that, but what else are you seeing coming out of the shoemaker surviving mold camp regarding endotoxins? Why all of a sudden the attention? We didn't know what a nasty toxin bacteria make. We didn't know the extent of brain injury from exposure to endotoxins. And I worry about people in your field who might be assuming that, you know, they, they, they've, they've got their, their, their nice uh, Tyvek suit on and they've got some this exposure protection and that exposure protection. But endotoxins uh, stay in the air for a long period of time. You can get rid of it with an iodapt air, but specifically endotoxins are brain rotters. They really are. And I have spent the last 10 years focusing my attention on how do I fix the brain injury. It's one thing to be tired. It's one thing to have a cough. It's one thing to have pneumonia. It's one thing to have pulmonary hypertension. But where's the brain injury coming from? And what's all this Alzheimer's explosion we're hearing about in the United States? Well, so a large percentage of those are being injured by environmental exposures. I had a client um, I'm dealing with actually right now, um, north of me, who had a sewage loss flooded their entire lower level or most of it, a hall bathroom flooding the nearby kitchen, straight up category three black water lost. Um, it was a bad situation. Uh, kids crawling around the floor, hired a company before they got me involved to remediate and basically treated it like a modified water dry out job where they set up marginal containments, no engineering controls, um, let the you know, we let some of the cabinets just stay there versus removing them. Yeah, uh, I, I think our industry, for some reason, we have all this wonderful uh, documentation, all these standards to help guide us, like the IICRCS 500 that deals with black water losses. But the industry sure doesn't. I, I thought we were bad with mold. Um, we, you know, these people are setting up containments. The homeowners are going back and forth through the, through the containment, not realizing the potential exposure risk. They had little, they got littles running around everywhere. Um, there's exposures to that. Um, we ended up doing endotoxin samples um, uh, for, for legal purposes to document that, but it's a, it's a serious concern. Um, we know that according to your research, we taught you to use the term brain rot and how it can affect people. So clearly it's, a consideration to add into our toolbox of testing. Um, can somebody um, have, I mean, is, is endotoxins one of those things where 
it's just endotoxins. They, they may not, they might have an actino problem in their house. There might have a mold problem in their house, um, but it's the endotoxins. Or does this go back to, we don't know. It depends on the genetic susceptibility of the individual. Well, if you don't have a neuroquan, you won't be able to answer the question about causation. And what we know is in this, this paper you showed briefly, the paper that's, that hasn't been submitted yet, so it's not published, and I can't defend it as being published because it's not. But specifically, we're going to be able to look at a hurts me too and have a pretty good idea combining that, uh, excuse me, look at a neuroquan and combining that with all the other things we have to be able to say what was involved. Because one of the problems is we see people sick in 10 years ago and 15 buildings ago or 10 buildings ago. How are you going to sample the building from 10 years ago? Well, that's a silly question. But specifically, you can look at the pattern of the brain activity and say, who was here? I mean, you can tell the lion by his, by his tracks by the water hole, even though the lion's long gone. The lion was here. Here are his tracks. Here's the brain injury. Endotoxins do this most commonly. And you get a statistical management of, of the situation. And yeah. now if you get actinos, then you've got to put in the metabolic things. Because do you have now pulmonary hypertension? Do you have Warburg physiology? You know, where's this all going? Do you have both going on? Because if you've got both going on, you've got brain injury from endotoxins and brain injury from brain on ice. You mentioned all this testing. Um, I said all this testing, NeuroQuant and Genie. Unfortunately, these are not things that you can just pull up to a drive through and order. They're not so readily available. They're not around every corner. If someone's listening right now and wants to learn more about, you know, the clinical pieces of how can they diagnose themselves, what would you, where would you have them go? Because they're lost. Well, they're not going to talk I've to gotta, the clinician that doesn't know anything. Because there is a flagrant conflict of interest. Okay, well, to go um, ahead and talk um, about that. Um, I can't recommend someone go get a genie because... Uh, as an inventor, I would profit from that, and that was, that's, that's right. not ethical. You know, we're not we're not going to do that. Right. But if the physician has looked at things and says, "I don't know what more to do," and then the patient says, "Well, how about that fancy test that costs seven hundred twenty dollars? That's a lot of money." Uh, to it's gone down that. since I've heard last. It's gone down in price. Yeah. Well, when it, it's 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 refined, it's refined. Yeah. yeah. But so, specific, okay. please specifically. If we are looking for the tracks of the lion by the waterhole, we can only use the, the tracks that is left behind. Those were the ones that are our markers, our biomarkers of persistent objective parameters that can't be made up. And if you have objective parameters, fix them and watch them go away because we've got the, the, the ability to do that now. On mold, we have a hurts me too scoring system that you created on actino my studies you or actino bacteria you have the indices the pi and the di which is something that is provided from envirobiomics if you order that they'll show you that which is a helpful tool to help all end users figure out this whole human habitat and thank god for that because uh it's been a nightmare Otherwise, looking through hundreds of different types of bacteria, taking outdoor control samples and trying to compare the two is way more exhaustive than doing a comparison between that and an ERMI. What do we have in the works, if any, for endotoxins? Currently, all we have is the laboratory's uh, proprietary interpretation of set, said quantities or concentrations of endotoxins, but I don't see a shoemaker's stamp anywhere. Uh, can, is there any, anything you can tell us about that? Well, the, the cutoff when we correlate with Genie is 100, not 200 anyway, just to get that started. Oh, okay. Yes, that's right. The normal levels, according to Envirobiomics on their lab for endotoxins, is less than or equal to 200, correct? Yeah, and, and for sick people, it's 100. Okay, I'm listening. Okay, so that is helpful. So specifically, what we're going to need to do is pull out the Genie, because CD... Uh, 14 is specific for endotoxins. If you look at what CD14 is, one of these clusters of differentiation, this is a molecular marker for exposure to endotoxins. Well, guess what? We use that as one of the markers. We have four of them. There are three toll receptors uh, that also show up positive in endotoxins. Right now, those are the only molecular methods to say 
of endotoxins, but it doesn't tell you whether it's a pseudomonas or a serratia, for example. And I don't know how we're gonna get that information without getting next generation sequencing of people who are sick with endotoxins. That's, that's gonna be a, a nightmare. Any advice you can give IEPs from, from your clinical experience of, and some of us I realize is, is the responsibility of the IEP, but what nuggets of advice can you give to an IEP that shows up to a home, has experienced maybe some previous classical water intrusions like a roof leak, maybe a plumbing drip leak underneath the kitchen sink, that sort of thing. Are they going all, all Mary, uh, you know, all out and taking a sample or doing a fab sample of mold and endotoxins and actinos? Or is there any way to help be re save money where possible, be responsible, but feel like we're not cutting corners and not do all three? If you have a person with a cognitive deficit, and he says, my brain isn't the same as what it used to be. I can't think the way I used to. I'm nervous. I'm depressed. If there is a neurologic correlate, right now, I don't think of uh, chemicals that you need antidepressants for. I think you need to know what's wrong in the brain that we can identify. So a neuroquant is, unfortunately, you've got to find an MRI facility that'll do that test for you. And there is some problems around the country we found some MRI places that don't do it, or they don't do a, a general morphometry report, which is what I need. But specifically, if we are going to be thorough, you do all three. If you don't know ahead of time, you do all three. If you get a gentleman that hurts me too, and it comes back at, at six, you don't need to do fungi. And I'll save you 150 bucks, yeah. 25 bucks. And how are you gonna rule out actinos by looking or smelling is beyond me because they may have moved from where they first came in when there was water damaged uh, in the hallway when, when the front door was open in the rainstorm. Those actinos that came in with the rain, by, by next month, they're in the bedroom. Okay, we need to talk about that, Richie. Are they getting in their actino vehicles and driving over the carpet? How are they getting from point A to point B if we're talking about anything over a, a linear inch, let's say they're going from one bedroom to a, another bedroom. Well, they, they, they get out their, their famous weapon, the pseudo hyphae, and they walk. They can climb over obstacles. They can climb off on glass. You know, it's just remarkable to see what these guys do. I've seen it under a microscope, or I don't know if it was SEM or something, but I literally saw they, they, they it's almost something out of a sci-fi movie at yeah. a mi microscopic level. But right. what we're saying is, is if you have a, a huge colonization or presence of these, they're trying to conquer the cellulose domain and they will communicate with each other. It's biological warfare and strategy at a level we never appreciated. They've been doing it for millions, billions of years. We're just now realizing how effective it is. Uh, and it's, it's kind of crazy. It's kind of amazing to step back from the days of, throwing bleach on on a wall because there was mold there and saying you've cut, got the problem conquered to what we're talking about today, Richie. This is absolutely incredible. It's a state of the art. If you don't keep up, you're behind. You know, <laughs> I, you and I have known each other for a, quite some time and it's been one heck of a positive journey. I've learned so much from you, Richie. Um, and I don't know who else is doing your work. I'm sure there are other people that are, you know, nose to the grindstone and they're too busy to even come up for air. But I'm so thankful for what you're doing because it, it's like you got to start somewhere. At one point, you started with a tape lift. And now we're talking about transcriptomics. We're talking about gene, gene expression, being able to look at the evidence of what was there, the tracks in the, the prints in the mud, so to speak, from the Align example that you've given. This is huge. And, and tying it all together with these more forensic, newer types of technologies to welcome them, there is the science. Speaking of that, uh, before we close out today, if someone wanted to learn more, I mean, I have these papers here, but if someone wanted to learn more about the research on Actinos, 
the, the molds are out there in, in, in volumes, but on the actinos or the endotoxins, what would you recommend? They, 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 they trust us, but they kind of want to do their own research. What would you, where would you recommend they start? Well, there are five papers that are all readily available for free on the surviving mold website. So okay. Just, where, do they, where do they go? Is that a fair question? Uh, I don't know. Okay. Are they Actino ones? Yes. Okay. It's so they can in 2021. That'll help. Okay. So they can search surviving mold uh, for the 2021 papers on Actinos that get the, that will get that started. Is that your is that your recommendation? Yep. Okay. Very good. Um, Richie, any closing thoughts before we end today? Uh, just clinical experience, helping us IEPs appreciate the total picture here. Anything that we didn't cover uh, that you'd like to mention before we, we finish? I want to make sure that we, we give credit to co-authors and co-workers. Dr. Scott McMahon uh, has been writing papers with me for a while. David Lark, who I think is one of the smartest guys I've ever known uh, from Australia, uh, is um, been doing heroic work. Andy Heyman, is leading the, the, the unification of a different approach from my protocol that combines the principles of my protocol with some medicines that are newer that I didn't know how to use. So Andy Heyman needs to get good credit. And uh, if, if I've left people out, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, that's one of the way it goes when you get old. Speak about getting old, I hope I get old enough to see the next sequencing because I think that we're developing a study it's well, it's it's twenty percent down now. That will look at how we can correct the indoor environment of a water damaged building inexpensively to take care of fungi, actinos, and endotoxins inexpensively without burning down the house, without throwing away the toilet and everything else. So I'm I'm really looking forward to that. And so what you're telling me, Richie, is that even though we've made leaps and bounds with remediation techniques for microbial contamination, you're saying we might even be able to take this to the next level of, of addressing indoor air quality and exposure? By the time we have this talk next year, we'll be there. Right on, right on. Thank you so much, Dr. Shoemaker, for your time today. Look forward to having you on this podcast in a future episode. Take care. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. The content of this show is for informational purposes and represents the sole opinion of the host and its interviewees only. Any reliance on the information provided in this show is done at your own risk. Additional opinions and or research may change our current view of the topics spoken in this show. We do our best to minimize any inaccuracies presented and make legitimate efforts to back all comments with our own field experience, independent literature, or studies that support the topics discussed. This information should not be used to make conclusive decisions regarding your health or exposure. Ultimately, all questions and or concerns regarding your health should be addressed by a qualified physician. Additional exposure concerns and or questions pertaining to the health of your home or building should be addressed by qualified and on-site professionals. Any and all products and services discussed in this show should not be construed as a recommendation, endorsement, or guarantee that their use is appropriate for your situation. In short, we hope this information is of value to you, but please do not act upon it without actual and individual consultation and guidance by professionals who have taken the time and appropriate collection of data to assess your unique situation.